Perfect. Well, thank you for uh, joining Saber Chicago for another weeknight Zoom session. So we're honored to have tonight's guest. Um, I'm Bill Perch. I'm the newsletter editor for the Chicago chapter and uh, looking forward to this interview. Uh, Elizabeth is somebody that uh, I've been trying to, to schedule time to talk to. I think she has an absolutely fantastic job. I kind of mentioned with her just right before we, we started chatting, uh, just how jealous I am to think about the opportunity of covering baseball the way that she does. And um, so I want to thank everybody for being a part of this. And we're going to, we have an hour tonight, so we'll, we'll wrap up at eight o'clock. And uh, we're going to, again, kind of steal what, uh, what we've learned from our friends from Milwaukee. And we're going to do a little extra 30 minutes of bar talk. Uh, recording is off at that point in time. Um, so feel free to uh, hang around afterward and uh, we'll have a little more casual talk. So um, as we typically do, if you have questions, I have a whole series of questions for her. Um, feel free to enter questions in the chat. I'll try to field those the best I can um, as we go along. And um, as well as we get toward the end, we'll have a free for all and let people just unmute themselves and ask any questions on the way out. So um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Elizabeth Mortor. And uh, the, the bio that we sent out said, her three favorite things are baseball, writing, and editing. She's been a baseball fan since she was nine years old and has turned that enthusiasm into a full-time role as a homepage editor for Major League Baseball. That's absolutely impressive. I'm totally jealous of that. When she's not editing stories and web pages for MLB.com, she's also newsletter editor for the Internet Baseball Writers Association of America writer for Rising Apple, the New York Mets site within the fan-sided network, writing for Girl at the Game, a female-founded sports media company that promotes female voices in sports, co-hosting a Mets and MLB-focused podcast, Cohen, podcast, Cohen's Corner. With her work, she aims to inspire other sports fans to find their voice and express themselves confidently. Her writing has been published by MLB.com, the Baseball Hall of Fame, the Twin Bill, Rising Apple, and the girl at the game. Quite an impressive resume. So I'm well, I'm I'm pleased to welcome Elizabeth for our discussion tonight. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I feel like that makes me sound a lot more impressive than I actually am. Um, but oh. yeah, I'm looking forward <laughs> to chatting with you guys. Um, I always love talking about anything baseball related. So this is a real treat. So thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, keep in mind, tons of Cubs fans, Sox fans. And uh, I, I know when uh, I was mentioning about the New York Mets, I'm sure there's going to be some 1969 fans on here who probably still have a beef with the Mets. So we can discuss that later if that comes up. So, um, so I wasn't yeah. around then. I don't have much to add there. So. <laughs> right. I just missed that myself. <laughs> So I can't speak too much to that. So if you can, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about your background and um, what do you do specifically for MLB.com um, as well as the Internet Baseball Writers Association and everything else that you do? Sure. Um, yeah. So originally, uh, I guess a little bit about me, as you guys know, as Bill already said, uh, I grew up a Mets fan. I'm from Long Island, New York, originally um, about 45 minutes east of Manhattan. I grew up, you know, being able to take the train to City Field, or it was Shea Stadium originally, and then now City Field. So yeah, grew up a huge Mets fan, still am. And yeah, that was a big part of my childhood and then kind of seeped into my college years and my adulthood as well. Um, went to the University of Virginia undergrad, which was a wonderful experience, um, and then lived in Northern Virginia for a couple of years after graduating um, for my previous job. And then I moved back to the New York area when I started working at MLB last year. And so, yeah, essentially, as Bill said, what I do for MLB, I'm a homepage editor, which basically means that most of the time, like in season, I get assigned to different, and anyone who has like my job, or we also have seasonals with a similar job, but basically I get assigned to different games and then I'm responsible. So say it's like the Cubs White Sox game, then I'm responsible for editing all the content that the reporters write for that game and also updating both teams' websites throughout the day or throughout my shift with you know, things that have gone on in the game or other news that comes through about both of those teams. And then kind of a few other things behind the scenes as well of making sure certain videos get cut from the game, making sure other aspects of the websites get updated, um, kind of adding to these other content initiatives that we have that show up on the home pages and show up like on Google and stuff. So some kind of more behind the scenes things and then some more kind of front facing, you know, writing headlines for the articles that the reporters write, um, kind of adding in like photos and videos and make, making trying to make our 
articles and stories as much of as engaging as possible for readers and making sure that you know there's like links to the appropriate things and so and also just editing them to make sure that the writings is clear um, and concise as possible. So that's mostly what I do. Um, I really, I love like the writing and or I love the editing part of it. I also do get to write sometimes. Um, so my role is not primarily writing, but I've written a few articles here and there just on different topics. A couple I've been assigned, a couple I suggested, um, which is one of the things I really like about my role is I feel like, especially in our, in the content department in general at MLB, there's a lot of kind of flexibility and like fluidity in people's job titles. So like just people I work with who I don't know like what their actual job title is. I just know like what they're generally in charge of like when I'm working. So I feel like there's a lot of room for, you know, if you have ideas and want to like write about a certain thing or, you know, I feel like there's a lot of recep uh, very, you know, good reception for that. Even like last year as a seasonal, um, I was seasonal last year and then got a full-time role in December. Um, I was lucky because someone actually left, which doesn't happen that often. There's not a lot of turnover in the department. So um, so I was lucky that that opened up for me, but, but yeah, I've been working at MLB basically for a little bit over a year. Um, and then I was editing the newsletter. So for the internet baseball writers association, um, I started working on that in 2020, kind of, I basically joined that as a way to, I don't know, it was during the pandemic, like baseball wasn't on for like three months. And so I kind of wanted to fill the void with like figuring out what other baseball things I could get involved in. So I started, I joined that in like, the summer of 2020 I forget what month it was um and then there when their newsletter was going to launch in October I applied to be an editor for that um and I really enjoy working on that too because I I get I get to know like a lot of the different um members that write for the newsletter every month and read a lot about different teams and I've learned a lot about like random historical baseball things that I like never would have known about which people write a lot about for the IBWAA newsletter so that's another thing that I, it's just like a nice part of my week. And I, I enjoy kind of putting that out there and also trying to kind of now use some of the things I learned, like working at MLB to also make the newsletter, the IBWAA newsletter as engaging as possible. There's a lot of kind of similar things involved in like producing an article for MLB.com and like editing a newsletter and like making that as fun as possible. So I try to kind of use similar skills in both, but yeah, that's generally a summary of what I do. And it's nice because like, especially in baseball, if I'm assigned to a game, like you go into a shift and like, I don't know what's going to happen in the game. It could be a no hitter. It could be a really boring game. Like you just don't know. So the adrenaline um, rush of like, just not really knowing what's going to happen during the game is a lot of fun. And sometimes it's like a little bit chaotic, but you just have to like embrace that. So that's something I've learned too over the last year. Um, embrace yes, the game. Like, like last night's Mets game. I was not working uh, last night's Mets game. I was watching it, but I enjoyed it a lot. So Yes, that would have been very chaotic to work. But if I were working it, I would have still been very happy the Mets made it chaotic because I, you know, obviously would have wanted them to win anyway. Right. <laughs> Perfect. Well, that's fascinating. But can you tell us a little bit about how you went about getting those jobs? Um, and, and I know you're doing you're more than just MLB.com and Internet Baseball Writers Association, some of the podcasting that you do. I mean, it, it, it seems like all of your free time goes into this, but how did you, how did you actually go about getting noticed, getting, um, getting involved? Yeah, I guess the first, it's funny. So like, and when I was in college, I didn't, I did an internship um, between my second and third year at the hall of fame, at the baseball hall of fame, which was amazing, but I didn't really like seriously consider pursuing a sports career until after I gra graduated college. So the first like baseball related thing I did was actually starting to write for Rising Apple in October of 2019. And honestly, the only reason I started doing that was because like the Mets had just missed the postseason. And I was like, damn, like I'm going to miss them so much. Like I wanted to like do something Mets related to like still kind of feel connected with the team in the off season because they they missed the playoffs by like three games in 2019, I think. And so it kind of occurred to me that there was all, and I had been on Twitter, like I followed some people on Twitter who like wrote for various blogs and things. So I knew that was kind of a thing that I could do. Um, but I didn't really realize just how many different like blogs and like websites there are just about baseball or other sports in general. So I kind of was just looking for something where I could write casually about anything Mets related that I wanted and Rising Apple just seemed like a good fit for that at the time. And, and I, I don't write as much of them anymore, usually like around once a month, just because sometimes I write articles for work now. So I just, I don't have so much, you know, mental room to like write all these things. But so I started writing for them in October, 2019 and quick, quickly realized that I just really loved doing it. And 
I had never really like written about baseball before, but I also just felt kind of at home with like the community of people I met who also wrote for Rising Apple, like, you know, in our like chats and stuff that like, I didn't grow up with a ton of baseball loving friends. It was like me and my dad. And like, I didn't have a group of friends who like, I could really talk about baseball with. And so it was kind of cool, like realizing that there were all these communities out there that even throughout college, I had just never been aware of. So I was, I wrote for Rising Apple for a few months um, and then started right. I wrote a few, I've written a few articles for um, Girl at the Game as well and joined the IBWAA and kind of was thinking like, you know, okay, if I gather enough like baseball related experience and like share my work on Twitter and try to like interact with people, you know, this is something that I feel like I'm really interested in doing because my previous job, I was not baseball related at all. It was more like a technical consulting role. And I just felt like it really wasn't, it didn't fit me at all. Like, I didn't feel like I had the skills to like want to go further in that industry, but I felt like, oh, well, baseball writing, you know, they're paying someone to do this stuff. So it is a job. So it, I kind of just realized like, you know, I know the sports industry is like kind of wacky and like, you know, all over the place, but I just felt like it really was something I was passionate about and may as well try to pursue a job. In. And so I started looking for like full-time and like seeing kind of what was available. And I applied for some jobs that were like similar to what I'm doing at MLB, but not just baseball, like similar things at like NBC sports, for example, you know, like not, you know, similar type of role, but for other sports as well. But the seasonal role at MLB, I think someone I followed on Twitter already like shared it. And like, that's how I found out about it. And actually someone who I, the MLB director at Fansided had like worked with someone who was also like recruiting for this role at MLB. So they were able to like put my name in for that. So that ended up being really helpful, my Rising Apple like experience. And yeah, so I applied for the seasonal role at MLB and, you know, it, it sounds kind of crazy going from like my pretty cushy like pay wise like tech related job to a seasonal role at MLB but luckily I was able to like you know move back home to basically pursue that because I just it just seemed like such a good fit you know I I like all sports but like baseball is really my number one sport you like I like it a lot more than like most other sports and I do like other sports so I just felt like that was such a good fit and that was the, the only thing that I like got an offer for out of like everything that I applied for and I was like this just seems like you know these thing opportunities don't just fall from the sky so so yeah I started working there last March and that was kind of how I got into it just like accumulating a few other writing and editing experiences and then just kind of you know building that up and trying to share my work and and yeah it ended up working out and I was thrilled and yeah that that was that was very fortunate and then I've tried to kind of keep growing my like writing prowess as well as my editing skills since then. Mm -hmm. So was the the application process for MLB, how difficult was that in terms of the materials you're submitting? Are they, how critical were they? Were there different things that they were looking for? Like, can you walk us through that? Yeah, um, I mean, the main things I submitted really were just like a normal resume cover letter. And I think I think I did a list of like links to things I had written so I had just like a list of like you know linking to my like author page on like Rising Apple for example and a couple other things um and I forget the interview process it was basically like a phone interview that I had to do like an editing test where they sent me some stuff I had to like write headlines for it and like et fact check it and edit it um and then there was another interview after that so it wasn't too long and drawn out I think the whole process from when I applied to when I got the offer was like a month so all in all, or maybe it was a little bit less, actually. I don't remember. But I remember applying in February and I got the offer, I think, in March. So wow. some around then. So not, I think, because at that point also they were hiring like for, because I, I applied for a seasonal role and they wanted people to be trained before the season started or like during spring training. So I basically started like right at the end of spring training last year. Um, so that was kind of the last wave of the few people they had hired last season so that they could be trained like by the time the regular season started or at least on the way to like no being able to do stuff by then so so yeah sure. not too terrible of an interview process um i would say cool cool so uh you know obviously with with mlb 30 teams and you're can you walk us through a typical day uh, of however you cover the game you, you did you mention that you get assigned particular games how does that work and, and can you just walk us through 
Yeah, sure. So basically the way they like schedule people to like work each game, like there's one person assigned to a game. So like, for example, it was Cubs, White Sox. So yeah, like I, and I'm not, they, it kind of depends on the time zones too, because MLB has people in, you know, all time zones throughout the country. So like I'm on the East coast, I tend to work more of the earlier games and like that ends up being a lot more of like the Eastern division teams, but not necessarily. Um, and then like people who live, they have people who live in California and do this job and end up working more West coast games. And actually they do that on purpose. They like want kind of people in different areas so that they don't have, they don't have to have someone in New York working a game that starts at 10 PM. Like that basically never happens. So, which is nice. That'd be a little bit too late, but right. <laughs> yeah, I would say typical day I sign on around like an hour before the game is supposed to start. And then there's kind of, we have basically a checklist of things we have to go through, which is constantly changing because they're adding new like content initiatives in and like taking some out. So we, we really have to be like flexible. I mean, it's not constantly changing, but like some week to week, sometimes things change. So then there's like a checklist of things that we're supposed to do before the game. So we have to like update certain parts of the website and then prep some stuff for articles that might be coming later. Then during the game, we have to, you know, if like someone hits a home run or like major things happen, we like update the websites with that. And then sometimes there's articles that come in during the game. Like if someone gets injured or someone has a major milestone, like for example, I wasn't working this game, but Miguel Cabrera hit his 3000th hit, uh, got his 3000th hit on Saturday, I think. And I was actually scheduled to work the game on Thursday when he ended up being intentionally walked in the eighth inning. So I was like waiting that whole game. I was like, is he going to get a hit? Like I was already, I had everything prepped. And of course it didn't happen. And like something else happened. So we had to deal with that. So yeah. So then there's things, there's like a certain checklist of things we have to do like during the game. And then after the game, um, the reporters like write their main article for the game or for the day then. So then I edit those and put like produce those and put those on the websites. And then there's kind of a couple other things to update with like embedding some videos elsewhere on the team sites um and like a few like tweets and stuff like that so and they also other in addition to like the articles the reporters write there's also a few other files they sometimes update like if someone has an injury update we have a every team has like an injury updates file so sometimes we have to update that pretty frequently so yeah there's just a lot of things to like and then also we have to like make sure that certain videos get cut from the game so we can like have those embedded in the articles and also on these a few other places as well. So we, there's a lot of like multitasking in terms of watching the game and like being aware of something and communicating with people too, because there's different MLB uses Slack for everything. So we like communicate in a few different Slack channels. There's like one about, you know, major game updates. And then we have like a Slack channel with the reporters and then a Slack channel with the people working on the videos. So there's kind of a lot of um, like irons in the fire, I guess, in terms of just things going on. So, and it's definitely like, it can feel a little, like when I first started training, I was like, how on earth does anyone like handle this by themselves? But it definitely is something where like, they give you enough reps with people. Like now I'm helping train people. So I can see from their perspective, like how overwhelming it can be, but it, it's definitely something that I've gotten used to and kind of just embracing the chaos. And now that I like, feel like I know what I'm doing more, I do look forward to like things, like exciting things happening, because even if it's more work for me, it's like cool to have worked it. So Sure. So yeah, I would say that's like just a typical routine. And then usually I'm done like between three to four hours after, the, or usually like around three hours after the game ends. Um, sometimes it depends if there's like a rain delay, then my shift is longer. If the game is fast, then my shift is shorter. So it kind of just depends on like what the news of the day is. But usually I end up working around eight hours per shift. So it's not like crazy long days most of the time. Great, cool. Well, one of the, the questions I was thinking about, um, just from the, the radio programs that I listen to locally, everybody grew up following a team. You know, you have you had the guys that were the Sox fans, you know, Cubs fans growing up um, that you're attached to. And as they made their career progression and wound up covering sports and specifically baseball, they struggle with being a fan of a team and having to cover them. And it was really funny because if you go back to 2005 with the White Sox winning the World Series, there were a lot of guys on the radio that on, on the particular station that I listened to that said, I had a problem kind of keeping that separate. The hmm. fan in me started to come out. You're a Mets fan. 
how do you deal with that if you're covering the team? I mean, because yeah. the team can be doing well, they might not be, and you need to balance that on a professional level. Yeah. I, I think it helps that I'm not like a reporter, so I don't have to like cover them and like be with them like every day. So it, like, honestly, it's, it's funny. I almost preferred not working Mets games because I'm more emotionally attached to them, but <laughs> I do think, and that comes into play. Not only, like, I think it, it does make it a little bit more, like sometimes it makes it a little, a little bit more challenging, but I also think just as a baseball fan, I can appreciate when like important things are happening. So like, if I were working a game where, you know, things have happened for the other team, like, for example, last year, I worked the game where the Brewers clinched the NL central against the Mets. So I was like, the Mets lost the game. So like, whatever, but it was still cool because, you know, and they were already eliminated. So it like, wasn't a huge deal, but it was cool. Like working a a game where like the other team clinched and like, I like the Brewers. I don't have anything against them really. So I do think sometimes like that is something I've had to do is like, remember, like, you know, you do kind of have to separate, like, I think it really comes into play when I'm thinking about how to present the content on the website. So like, say I'm working like a Mets Phillies game, for example, and like the Phillies, for example, like won the game. And like, I don't like the Phillies, but I have to make sure like their website has to be excited about the Phillies. So like if Bryce Harper hits a home run and I'm working a Phillies game, like I don't like it, but I have to make sure that like the headline is like excited, you know? So Mm -hmm. I've definitely had to there. I feel like I have my internal voice and then my like voice that like goes on the website and like, depending on what's going on. So you do kind of have to separate that, I think. Um, So that's why sometimes I prefer not working the Mets games because then like, for example, if I, if I was assigned to like, you know, like Rangers A's, I'm like, I don't care who wins. So I'm more just like doing my job. And then it's like, I don't really care what, I don't care what happens. So whereas if I'm working a Mets game, then I'm more emotionally invested in the results. So I think I definitely still care, obviously, like I always want them to win, but I do think it's important to make sure that like I'm putting, you know, I'm put, I'm giving hundred percent effort to everything. And like, if it's the other team, like I'm making sure that their website reflects what their fans want to see. And I think that's, that's really important. Um, just because, you know, we want our content to be excited about every team. Like there's some teams that obviously haven't been very good and like, aren't spending a lot of money, like the pirates, for example, but we have to make sure that like, if exciting things happen, like someone's looking at it. So we have to put a hundred percent effort into every team and not just like the big market teams, because you know, people, there are lots of eyeballs on like everything that we are doing, even if, you know, some teams are higher like profile than others. Uh, so I, I do think almost in a reverse way, it's made me care. I still care about the Mets, but I now care like more about teams and players that I never knew about really before I started this job. So I've definitely become a lot more aware of, the league as a whole, which is one of my favorite parts of the job, because then I just like see all these weird things, cool, weird things that are happening um, and learn about players that I would not have heard of otherwise. Sure. Sure. Well, you're, you're talking about, you know, living, you're working in the here and now and games happening and, you know, not quite knowing what's going to come up, but the lockout actually provided a unique challenge. And one of the one of the aspects that fans noticed was as soon as that went into effect, content seemed very different through MLB social media and on MLB network. We're seeing a lot of, oh, I saw that game when I was a kid. Um, can you explain a little bit about that and, and how that might have provided obstacles? Because you're not covering the day to day. Yeah, well, basically, they had to get all this prepped because they basically knew the lockout was like going to happen. So I actually wasn't working. Like I, I was kind of between my seasonal role and I hadn't yet started my full-time role. So I actually wasn't working like when the lockout started. So I didn't have to do any of this luckily, but basically they had to pretty much scrub the websites of like current player stuff because with like how I don't hundred percent know, but basically with like the CBA expiring, then there was some sort of licensing thing where they MLB properties were like not allowed to talk about like players on 40 man rosters, like at all. And reporters couldn't write about them either. So yeah, basically the website, the MLB.com and the club sites turned into like, you know, a history lesson for like three months, pretty much, which was what it was challenging because it just made everything seem a lot like, like sadder because you're like, damn, like there's no, like the players that are exciting that are now like weren't anywhere. So that was kind of sad, but but it did also give us an opportunity to like, we did this whole project over the winter about 
writing stories, highlighting players born on every single day of the year. So somehow our department cranked out 366 birthday stories in a span of like six weeks. I think I wrote like 11 of them, but basically just like pointing out five players, five prominent players that were born on every day of the year. And this is a project that, you know, we might've been able to do anyway, if it were normal times, but because there was just a lot less content overall, they could do a couple other initiatives that were more kind of longer form projects that they like might not have had the bandwidth to tack on uh, to take on otherwise so that was cool I liked doing those um but but yeah basically you know and then as soon as the lockout ended suddenly all the current players like you know their pictures weren't on their um MLB player pages for the duration of the lockout because it had to do with like their image was not allowed to be used by MLB like properties um but then as soon as the lockout ended that and it was kind of funny actually there were a couple times during the lockout where a player retired and then all of a sudden we could post about them. So it'd be like Ryan Zimmerman was nowhere for like two months and then he retired and all of a sudden he can be everywhere. Eh, I don't know exactly how that worked, but somehow that was allowed. So yeah, it was definitely challenging. Um, you know, when, cause the whole, like, I guess the whole reason like anyone's, any of us at MLB are doing anything is because of the seasons and like games happening and players being, you know, on their teams so knowing that it's like it does if things do feel a little emptier when that wasn't allowed um so i once the lockout ended i think more like i would say my own personal morale was much higher um even though i still enjoyed what i was doing during the lockout it was a lot calmer there was less to do but at the end of the day like the reason we're here is because of like the baseball season so i was happy when like that returned mm-hmm. Yeah, perfect. So, well, can you tell us a little bit about your writing background and not necessarily always sports, if there was some other inspiration uh, for you? Um, you know, are there baseball writers? Are there non-baseball writers that, that you've enjoyed or you've taken something away from or maybe even somebody that you're collaborating with? Yeah, um, I guess in my writing background, I mean, the person I probably learned the most about writing from was my dad because he, well, he was an English major in college and is now a lawyer. But in terms of like my actual education on like how to write well, I probably learned the most from him um, and a couple of my teachers throughout school as well. Um, and I, I also minored, I was um, in the undergrad business school at UVA. So I majored in like marketing and management there, but I minored in English and took a few English classes at school. And so I, in terms of like my early like education, English was always like my favorite subject. And I just really enjoyed, you know, some people like express themselves in different ways. I've always felt most comfortable expressing myself just in words, like that's into whether it's writing, I've never been good at art. Like I can't draw or paint or anything. I really can do that. Um, I was involved in the arts. So I did some like theater and like singing stuff, but in terms of like expressing myself, I always felt most comfortable like through words and writing. And just, that's like where I feel like I've, rather than math, which I never liked math um, or anything like that. So in terms of like baseball influences, it's funny. I feel like I, you know, as a Mets fan, I feel like the person I, who's writing, I've read the most like over the years is Anthony DiComo, who's written for MLB.com for the Mets since 2007. And now I work with him, which is like, cool. Sometimes I get a little starstruck still, because I would say he's like one of my biggest writing influences. I've always admired how he covers the team. Like his writing is very, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's always very like literary. It, it seems like it took a lot of time in a way, like, you know, when you read his articles, it's hard to believe that he probably wrote that in like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I've always just admired how he writes with like a very kind of thoughtful and like not overly ornamented in that way, but just, I feel like his writing is just very enjoyable to read. And I've always liked, you know, reading his articles a lot. And so it's cool that now I like get to work with him when I do a Mets game. So that's awesome. Um, so I would say in terms of like a baseball writer, he was probably the person I've like read the most just online over the years. Um, and actually I feel like now in terms of one of the questions that you had put in like the list of questions that you sent to me earlier was inspiration, like baseball writing inspirations. And there, I have two coworkers who their names are, um, Matt Monaghan and Michael Clare. And they're, I don't know what their official job titles are, but their kind of specialties are writing really like off the wall baseball stories. And like, they write things about like very, like some mascot from like the 1982 Giants or like they find these crazy stories that I don't know how they thought of this or whatever. And they just write the most incredible like 
wild, like wacky baseball things, just about kind of with a more pop cultural tinge rather than just covering the team. And I really love what they do. They worth checking out. Um, so I, I, you know, I would say sometimes the articles I've written for MLB.com try to be, I'm less interested in like the day to day of like writing about a team. And I kind of like more just feeling inspired by random baseball things I see in the world and like writing something about that. And I feel like they, they do that really well and kind of showcase how, you know, wacky and fun baseball can be. So, and then there's also, um, I don't know if any of you, maybe you don't, I don't know if any of you follow there's a Twitter account um, called Cespedes Family Barbecue, and the two guys who run that also work for Fox Sports and write for them. Um, their names are Jake Mintz and Jordan Schusterman. I think they're only a couple of years older than me, but they seem like very well seasoned um, in terms of baseball knowledge. But they also write really fun, like they just notice things that like I never have thought of. Like they wrote an article about like, you know, how much it would take for baseballs to land a home run to land in the water in like every, every ballpark and some it's like it happens and then some it's like impossible so they wrote they, they write these articles that are just on subjects that I like would have never thought of but they approach it from just a, such a playful perspective and I feel like you know they're two people who I they also do a couple of podcasts and I just enjoy all their content so I feel like in general my biggest inspirations are people who remind their readers and listeners that baseball is fun and like that's what their brand is and that's what I've tried to do in like the writing I've had and the stories that I've been interested in um been writing about sure yeah because I saw uh, a mention on Twitter that you posted maybe in the last week or two and and you were talking about how you were impressed that you were able to sneak in some pop culture references like x number into this one article and, and it it just kind of seemed it, it kind of goes back to what you're talking about it's like different writing styles and, and being able to bring a little extra fun into something so that just kind of made me laugh uh, you know it was at least seriously like a week or, or a week and a half ago yeah um but uh, well along those lines with social media um, there are different ways for people considering getting into sports media, baseball media, writing, podcasting, blogging, whatever they do. What advice do you have for somebody who's really thinking about that? Um, you know, willing to take that jump, um, advice that they have, the advice that you have, um, things that they should be doing, ways that they can hone their skills. Yeah. Um, it's funny. It's funny for me to like be asked that because I still feel like I need advice from people on like how to do things. You know, I'm like still pretty young and then only just, you know, fairly new in the industry as well. Um, but there's a few things I've noticed over the last couple of years. And one kind of like what I said earlier, I guess one of the first things I would say is, you know, if you're interested in like working in sports or like whether it's like writing or podcasting or whatever, like there's it's so easy now to create content and like put it into the world that, you know, you don't have to like have a job to do that. So I would say the first thing, and that's kind of how I got started is find some blog or write your own blog, write, make your own podcast. Like it's really easy to create content and you know, there is a lot, but you have to like start somewhere. So I would say, don't be afraid of like, just somehow, you know, figuring out what you're most interested, what skill you're most interested in honing at that moment, whether it's like, yeah, podcasting or even just creating kind of YouTube video essays. I follow a couple of people who do those really well about like different baseball topics. And yeah, I, I would say just kind of either find a blog that like takes contributing writers or just start creating something. Um, yeah, that's definitely something I would say. And then along those lines, you know, the way I've found out about a lot of sports things is through Twitter and through social media. And so not being afraid to like share your work and not, you know, it's not like you're too self-centered when you're like sharing your work because otherwise no one's going to see it. So I, I think not being afraid to like share your work is also important because then that's just important of kind of seeming, putting yourself out there as like a confident creator in whatever it is you're doing. Um, and then also, so I guess along, well, not exactly the same lines, but, you know, creating, just going out, like starting to do something putting it out into the world and also just being generous with praise of other people's work. Like if you like something, let somebody know. And I, I think I've, I've tried to do that a with people I work with now, just when they do great things, but people like to hear that someone has liked their work and that's a good way to like leave an impression on someone. So without like kissing up to them and like being annoying, I guess, but, but yeah, it's, it's nice to like be generous with praise of, of other people's work because 
a lot of times people just leave comments on things if they're negative. And I think it's really nice when someone like it sends like a nice DM on Twitter, for example, that says they really like something that you did. I think that's just a nice thoughtful gesture. If there's someone who you're interested in working with, just like reach out to them. A lot of people in sports are on Twitter and fairly accessible on social media or just by email. So it can never hurt to just like reach out and say that you like something they did. If you're not sure like what a good icebreaker would be, I would say that's a good one. Um, I guess the last thing I would say also is just being willing to like, even if you're new in sports or somewhat inexperienced, like recognizing that you, you know, offering to help someone else with their work. Like if, or if like, if someone posts a question, like answering, I don't know, just recognizing that you can still be helpful. And like networking isn't just about taking from others, but also recognizing that like you can provide, even if you're inexperienced, like maybe someone wants to interview you on their podcast or like maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe they need another writer, a contributing writer for something, but just offering to like help other people and not just like, not only like seeing them as a vehicle for you, but also just recognizing that like building relationships, you can help someone else too. So I think that's important as well. Um, yeah, I would say all, all of those things. Sure. Yeah, because it, it's funny what you're saying is, you know, just kind of stretching yourself, getting out there. I had my own little baseball blog that was just kind of for myself. It was just a way to put my thoughts and baseball memories and things I wanted to complain about with the Cubs. And as, you know, as social media became a little more prevalent, I was able to kind of share a little bit more of that. But one of the, um, one of the, the big challenges for me personally was joining you know, Internet Baseball Writers Association of America and, and starting to get my work published. Um, you know, I've, I've done a handful of those and that was intimidating, I have to admit, because you're taking content I would have generated and sharing it with a much wider base. And, mm -hmm. and it's been great working with the um, editors like you. You provide really good advice. Hey, I like this story. But here are a few little things that I think that'll that'll help it flow a little bit better, even if it's like a grammatical thing or just how it's organized. I think that's really useful. So I I absolutely encourage anybody that's uh, you know thinking about it. That's that's definitely an alternative out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, they're right behind you. There's a bunch of books. Um, I, I saw a, a tighter shot of it earlier. What are some of your favorite baseball? books and movies and uh, maybe some of them you're not a fan of. yeah Money yeah <laughs> I do love Moneyball um <laughs> I would say my favorite baseball books I read a few I, I would say I haven't read like all of them like a, a ton but I've definitely read a some over the years there was one that I used to check out from the library all the time I, I honestly forget what it was called you know what I'm, I'm pretty... saying I fuck with the scholarly ones y'all heard I, there was a book I really used to love when I was like 10 or 11 called um, Great Deba Great Baseball Beats Facts and First, which had like all these interesting like stats from the past that that kind of, I checked it out like all the time from the library. So that was one of my favorites um, growing up. And I would say like now I really loved um, R.A. Dickey's autobiography, whenever I, wherever I wind up, which actually didn't have that much about his Mets career in it, but his, the rest of his life and like thought process was just really uh really fascinating. I love, love that book. Um, there was another Mets book too. I really liked called Faith and Fear and Flushing. That was kind of just about the experience of growing up as a Mets fan. Um, the guy who writes it, Greg Prince also has a blog that has the same title that inspired this book. Um, I would say probably in terms of like the most kind of fat, one of the most fascinating baseball books I've read, um, was this book called the baseball codes. I forget who it's by, but I think I've read it a couple of times now, but it just talks a lot about like things you don't see watching on TV about baseball. So a lot about like unwritten rules, a, a kind of a lot about just the culture behind baseball that is, I just loved and found really interesting. Um, I would say baseball codes, probably in terms of like a book that has stuck out the most to me, probably that one, just cause you know, as I forget when I first read it, I was probably like 13 or 14 maybe, but it just was very fascinating because there's a lot in there that you really don't see on TV. And I, I love that. I would recommend that to anyone. Okay. And in, so, in terms of movie, you also asked about movies. So all the movies, yeah. Field of Dreams is my favorite movie of all time. I love, I'm obsessed with that movie. I've seen it like 20 times. I love it. Um, I also love uh, Moneyball, as someone said. Um, 
I really like, I mean, A League of Their Own, obviously, is also a classic. Uh, I would say there's not that many ones I, like, don't like. I haven't, like, seen every baseball movie. Um, yeah, I I don't know. A lot of people like Bull Durham. I would say that's not my favorite, to be honest. I know that's an unpopular opinion. Have you seen but... that movie, the show, by any chance? No. I have not. <laughs> but, yeah, I would say... Yeah, I would say there's not that many baseball movies I don't like. Like, I'll probably like it if it's baseball related. Um, also, another yeah, older. It has be in it. Oh, sorry. What was that? Pardon? Oh, sorry. Anyway, I didn't hear what he said. Um, I... Oh. I would say another like older baseball movie that I really loved was The Pride of the Yankees. Even though it's about the Yankees, I I don't know how many of you, have you seen it. It's it's a pretty famous movie, but. I, I watched that actually pretty recently and I had never seen it, but I just thought it was so cool that like Babe Ruth is in the movie. And I don't know, I like, I knew that yeah. going in, but just seeing, I, I don't think I'd ever seen like footage of him like talking ever before watching this movie. Right. So I would say I, I love that as well. So there's some like older ones and then some newer ones. Um, yes, Babe Ruth is dead. The movie is from 1948 or 1945, I think, but... <laughs> It's very, it's it's very old. The Jackie Robinson movie, Jackie Robinson's story, and he was in it. Oh, okay, yeah, I have not seen that, but I have heard of it. Interesting one. Yeah, I haven't seen that. That's actually my opportunity to plug Saber's digital library and the most recent book, uh, Not an Easy Tale to Tell. Please pick it up. It talks about movies like that and and all the issues around that, around uh, speaking about him in film and on on stage. So please check that one out. Um, Yeah, and and we we can have a whole discussion. You mentioned um, Field of Dreams. I know that can be fairly polarizing sometimes with uh, baseball fans. I'm always surprised by how many people don't like it because I've loved it for so many years. Like, I just can't fathom it. I know I'm like not the only person, like, I don't know. I I find it funny how polarizing that movie is. Um, Sorry. Sorry about that. And if you can mute yourself, um, if, if those are side discussions, but uh, well, but along those lines, I love the natural. I, I like the natural great. too. And I think I, I just enjoy the way it looks, but there are so many people that complain that it's not really realistic mm-hmm. and I get it, but it's a lot of it is the story itself. Yeah. You know, just let the story kind of carry and uh, yeah. you, know, you get lost in all of that. So that, that could be a whole follow-up discussion that we have. Um, so just kind of wanted to, to see if there's any way that you can shine a light on any up and comers, uh, baseball media that we should know about, um, if you start following them on social media, start reading what they're, uh, what they're saying, what they're doing. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of people, a few people who've written for Rising Apple who are also do great work. Um, there's this one one guy who um, also has a podcast. His name is Anthony Rivera. He has a show, Subway to Shea podcast um, that I really like. And there's another person who also wrote for Rising Apple um, named Greg Harvey. You can follow all these people on Twitter. I can even like send, if you want me, I can even like email you later, like their Twitter handles or something if people yeah, want to follow them. Um, Cause I follow all these people. There's a guy named Greg Harvey who does really cool like uh, interactive like graphics um, where they kind of shows like timelines of like, you know, Mets all time hit leaders. And it goes from like 1962 through today. So it kind of shows like how that's changed over time. Um, let's see. There's also um, a writer. There's a couple of writers for uh, MLB who I would say are up and coming just because they're a little bit younger. Um, the, the guy that just became a new pirates beat writer this year, his name is justice De Los Santos. He was a seasonal reporter last year for MLB and his work just has so much like energy and, and enthusiasm. And I have loved working with him this year. Um, he's fantastic. So if you're looking, I don't seem like there's a Pirates fan on here. Um, so whoever that was, uh, his content is great. 